my talk is a bit wide ranging. And uh, if I have to take a call, don't <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, <clears throat> I am tasked with talking to you about how the regime seeks to control our schools, our families, and even our speech by denouncing everything it dislikes as hate. Uh, but first, I want to talk about just what is the regime? What, what do we mean by that? And although I'm the last speaker today, I like to define what I mean by regime. <clears throat> just is what is this regime and what does it consist of? <clears throat> the regime, of course, includes the government. The government, as I show, is exerting its power in con to control expression and information, peddle official narratives, as we've just heard, dictate to schools and control and alter the substance of families themselves. Not only are they dissatisfied with controlling what goes on inside of the family, they wanna change the constitution of it in terms of gender. It seeks to define and delimit our rights uh, by suggesting that they have been accorded to us by the government in the first place. Uh, for example, when asked by a reporter whether she was upholding her oath to the Constitution uh, upon issuing a health order suspending the right to bear arms in Albuquerque and the surrounding county, Michelle Grisham, the governor of New Mexico, stated that no constitutional right, in my view, including my oath, is absolute. And uh, she and uh, she went on when a federal judge. Uh, struck down part of her executive order, she issued another one uh, banning the use of guns in parks and playgrounds. This is merely a, a trifling example of the most glaring cases of the kind of despotism that the state has attempted to arrogate to itself. I'll talk more about others later. Uh, by the way, I wanted to note that I'll be dropping a white peel at the end of this talk, so... This is the end, it will be an end to the bad news. But the regime, let's be serious, it includes more than the government itself. And it, all co it also consists of state apparatuses that are not strictly part of the government per se, including corporate entities that have been drawn into the state's ambit as state enablers and that effectively carry out state functions. I've called these corporate state apparatuses by the term governmentalities. Governmentalities are especially conspicuous today in the cases of big tech and big pharma. The former serve to censor, disseminate propaganda and control information, uh, Google, for example, while the latter is granted an exemption from liability and legal monopoly over medicines and vaccines in exchange for the extension and intensification of state coercion. So examples of big tech censorship and propaganda in collusion with the government are legion. And I've also written about how Google actually controls information to the point of disappearing people and news and so forth. So, I have to beg a little bit to differ with Karen. It's very hard to get information, thanks to these Goliaths who were funded by InQtel in the first place, the CIA's funding agency. Uh, but uh, we have seen big tech propaganda in collusion with the government of late. Of course, uh, the Twitter files and Missouri versus Biden provide the most recent illustrations. As I wrote in Google Archipelago, Big tech is an array of digital technologies that are adopted and used by the state to enhance state power. Uh, my argument has since been validated by these two issues, the Twitter files and the Missouri versus Biden. And uh, we saw with the Twitter files and that case, there's a direct pipeline between several government agencies, the DHS, the FBI, the NSA, CDC, et cetera, and the White House, uh, and social media companies to control information, suppress COVID conspiracy theories, and curate the political sphere by suppressing news and information about the political criminality of the Biden family. This collusion was corroborated, of course, by Missouri versus Biden, and 
Interestingly, Representative Stacy Plaskett went so far as to threaten Matt Tahibi, the journalist, with jail time for his testimony before a congressional committee regarding the Twitter files at the same time as the IRS ransacked Tahibi's home in New Jersey uh, while he was giving testimony. Such is the ruthless and devious character of this regime. Of course, the mainstream media is also a governmentality. Along with social media, the mainstream media disseminates official narratives and propaganda and buries or discredits conflicting information. The media is the priesthood of the, of the administrative regime because it defines and enforces the public orthodoxy with which the state identifies itself. So we've heard recently where Tucker Carlson said, listen, I know a lot of reporters are basically being told what to say, say by the CIA. Social media is also central to this priesthood, which explains uh, why Elon Musk, Musk's takeover of Twitter, rebranded as X, apparently poses a threat, and why Musk, no matter what else we might say about him, has been dogged by the regime ever since buying Twitter. And naturally, organizations like the Anti-Defamation League and the Southern, Southern Poverty Law Center are also governmentalities, as Musk has learned. Of course, as we've heard, the military-industrial complex, including the military contractors, is a governmentality, and the so-called proxy war in Ukraine is the latest example of the state and its governmentalities in action. The military-industrial complex extracts wealth from the productive class to expand the state's reach, but also to intimidate, suppress, and surveil the domestic population. Uh, now, this regime also includes state actors who, although not necessarily employees of the government or corporations per se, serve as its foot soldiers. These include the standard issue academics who disseminate statist ideology. Academia is one of the main ideological state apparatuses, to quote the Marxist Louis Althusser. Academics function to rationalize state power, to making it appear natural and inevitable. <clears throat> Writes Murray Rothbard, promoting this ideology among the people is the vital social task of the intellectuals. Uh, the minions of this class furnish uh, the state with its intellectual bodyguards, to quote Hans Hermann Hoppe. These are state agents whom, like Noam Chomsky, posture as radicals. Unsurprisingly, many of these radical academics are socialists. Why? The state encourages the proliferation of socialism because the state, because socialism is statist. So academics undertake ideological enforcement on the ground. For example, a Wayne State University English professor, one Stephen Shaviro, otherwise a nobody, made a rather strange Facebook post stating that it would be better to kill bigots uh, rather than to shout them down. The professor who has taught courses in film wrote, so here's what I think about free speech on campus. Although I do not advocate violating federal and state criminal codes, I think it is far more admirable to kill a racist, homophobic, or transphobic speaker than it is to shout them down. He did not lose his job. In other words, according to Shaviro, some speech merits their speakers a death sentence. That is, killing a human being is deemed morally preferable to allowing speech that one does not condone. We should not imagine that Shaviro's view represents an exception, however. It is now common among the establishment. For example, Arizona Governor Katie Hobbs' press secretary uh, recently resigned after advocating shooting transphobes in a tweet on the hills of the transgender shootings, kill, killing six people here in Nashville. Shaviro implied that a speaker's audience is qualified and authorized to determine whether a speaker is racist, homophobic, or transphobic, and thus deserves the death penalty. It must be noted that such, uh, such uh, viewpoints as Shaviro's uh, 
follow directly from a long lineage of status leftist theory, so-called. Namely, uh, Herbert Marcuse's 1965 essay, Repressive Tolerance. It has become the blueprint for the leftists who now rule the state. In Repressive Tolerance, Marcuse argued for the intolerance that statists and leftists currently demonstrate against expression of which they disapprove. That is, all expression other than their own. Marcuse argued that tolerance for expression was originally born in opposition to existing powers, but this was well before leftists gained full power. Real tolerance should not be impartial, says Marcuse. It should, it should favor only the then oppositional, i.e. leftist expression. Tolerance, as it, was, as it was practiced, according to Marcuse, was of two kinds. One, the passive toleration of established attitudes, and two, the act of official tolerance granted to the right as well as to the left, two movements of aggression as well as two movements of peace, to, to the party of hate as opposed to that of humanity. Uh, I call this non-partisan tolerance abstract or pure in as much as it refrains from taking sides. But in doing so, it actually protects the already established machinery of discrimination, he said. Now, let's just take apart this passage. <clears throat> that is, expression from the right supports aggression, hate, and the machinery of discrimination, while that of the left supports peace and humanity. This claim should surely strike us as ironic in 2023, just as it should have struck readers as ironic in 1965. But Barakusa saw pure or abstract tolerance as ridiculous. Uh, it would follow then that Marcuse would think that only leftist speech should be tolerated, and that is exactly what he argued. How did he justify this? Citing John Stuart Mill, the beginning of the slide into the sloth, Marcuse argued that tolerance was only ever supposed to be a means for promoting freedom and truth, thus improving the lot of mankind. And what kind of politics did Marcuse see as improving the lot of mankind? Well, leftist politics, of course. And how could Marcuse make this claim after the horrific repression and slaughter in the Soviet Union had already come to light? His reasoning necessitated exempting the left from the political crimes of leftism in power, of course. Instead, Marcuse focused his criticism on the West, and in particular the US, after all, it was the social order of the United States that Marcuse and his fellow travelers were intent on subverting. Why else, when they escaped Nazi Germany, would the Frankfurt School theorists have emigrated to the United States rather than to the obvious place, the Soviet Union? That is, unless they sought to enjoy the relative freedom and wealth of the US while mercilessly uh, working to tear it to shreds. So. Uh, Marcuse argues that real tolerance must begin with stopping the words and images which feed this consciousness, this consciousness that supports the repressive status quo. In other words, to have a liberating tolerance, as he called it, rather than a repressive tolerance, repression of the right is essential. And then Marcuse openly admitted, to be sure, this is censorship, even pre-censorship but openly directed against the more or less hidden censorship that permeates the free media. And who should be the arbiters of this expression? Well, people like Marcusa or Shaviro, of course. There you have it, suppression and censorship of the right are not only allowable, but absolutely necessary because the expression and deeds of the right cannot be tolerated if we are to have real tolerance. If that accounts for the regime's belief that it has the right, nay, the very obligation to shut down expression and action deemed regressive or of the right, the following accounts for its justification for using violence to do so. Re quote, but I believe there is a natural right of resistance for oppressed and overpowered uh, minorities to use extra legal means if the legal ones have proved to be inadequate. So there's your justification for violating the non-aggression principle in response to speech. Enter Stephen Shaviro and his ilk. They now hold near total power in the United States. 
But did it ever occur to such leftists as Marcuse that repression from this comes from the state and its governmentalities and thus vesting power in the left was a formula for totalitarianism? I suggest that it, he, it did, and that's exactly what Marcuse wanted. Leftism is endemically totalitarian. And now I'm going to shift to talk about uh, the political orientation of the regime. And I'm going to speak about globalism. And I, I want to just clarify what globalism is as I see it. Globalism is a, a simultaneous expansion of power and the state and the state's power at the same time as the erosion of the, of the home front of the nation itself of its sovereignty and so forth. This is a particular and very perplexing phenomenon and why uh, we're, many people are just baffled by what the hell's going on, right? So the top-down orientation of the current regime is globalism and it makes no practical difference whether the World Economic Forum, the United Nations or any other globalist organization are behind this program, although they are. It has been fully embraced by the state and its corporate governmentalities. Globalism does have as its aim, its aim the de facto, if not legal, dissolution of the sovereignty of the nation. It aims at eradicating borders, nullifying the Constitution, and abrogating the rights of its citizens. It means to control the consumption, reduce the living standards of its subjects, while also reducing their population, I'm afraid. Globalism uh, involves technocracy with an expert class wielding technological tools for surveillance, behavioral modification, and repression. Now, the globalist state seizes on various crises to accomplish these objectives, including pandemics, climate change, and war. At home and abroad, it thrives on anarcho-tyranny, cultural and political disorientation, the devaluing of the currency, and of economic sanctions uh, as well. It uses also something called stakeholder capitalism and its environmental, social, and governance, uh, governance index as weapons. Now, ESG is an extra or paragovernmental instrument of coercion that is increasingly backed by the government. What is wrong with it? It infringes on property rights, it distorts markets, and it coerces producers into accepting its precepts. It thereby establishes a woke cartel of approved producers while eliminating the non-compliant from the market and even civil life, all the while eroding the industrial energy and agricultural bases of the Western world. Now, you've heard of this term, and I'm trying to try to explain what the hell is going on with this. And this is wokeness. The quasi-official dogma of the status globalist regime is a leftist totalitarian ideology called wokeness. Wokeness functions to censor speech, suppress dissidents, and pit supposedly beleaguered identity groups against the majority. It denies property rights by forcing organizations to hire and promote people on the basis of identity and by treating ownership as a privilege that can be revoked. It aims at banning the freedom of association and eviscerating the remnants of the natural social order. Wokeness and anti-white racism are central to the administrative globalist state and its weaponized Justice Department and surveillance agencies who use them to attack the middle class majority whom they see as their primary adversaries, as those most inimical to their rule. They therefore buy the allegiance of special identity groups and weaponize them against the re regime's alleged foes. This explains the Biden administration's insistence that white nationalism represents the number one domestic threat to the nation when white nationalists comprise a minuscule fraction of the population. And meanwhile, corporate capitalists why do they embrace wokeness? Well, they carry the, the favor with the government and embrace the state religion because they understand who is wielding power and who can strip them of their wealth. They also recognize the power of the woke cartel, as I call it, which combines companies and some activists who threaten to cancel them if they fail to kowtow to woke demands. 
by sufficiently censoring speech, by adhering to official narratives, or meeting ESG criteria, including the promotion of transgender ideology. Thus cloaked under a thin scrim of anti-racist, progressive, and environmentalist, environmentalist rhetoric, wokeness is, a statist and central, is statist and centralized, but it also emanates from these extra-governmental organizations and corporations, these governmentalities. Uh, it is uh, which they impose extra governmental sanctions, both on businesses and individuals, over and above those dec uh, decreed by the state. Globalism represents a further great, great growth phase of this woke corporate state hegemon. Uh, woke imperialism, which you're seeing in full play uh, in c connection with Russia, uh, solves to, uh, works to dissolve any no national or local community and to intensify the globalist state's control and extension over more and more of the world. Uh, now I want to start throwing down some hope. Now this is a very uh, nascent but nevertheless uh, a very striking sign of possibilities. There's an emergent political force, albeit still nascent, taking shape. This movement uh, is all opposed to globalism, actually. It may be called localism. This movement seeks to resist the desiderata of the federal state globalists and to nullify their encroachments on self-determination. It envisions and builds parallel structures under local control. It localizes the control of the police, the sheriff, the school system, property protection, self-defense, the economy, and even privatized competitive banking with private currencies. Bitcoin is, is of course a key financial tool in its arsenal. Localizing and decentralizing these functions and functionaries means to resist the impositions of the federal government, including the Federal Reserve, and its statist globalist aspirations. Localist and decentralized movements are already underway in various states and localities, including in Idaho, Washington State, New Hampshire, and elsewhere. In the U.S., we have a legal basis for localism in the Tenth Amendment of the Constitution, which states that, quote, the federal government is, the only, is only authorized to exercise those powers delegated to it, and, quote, to the people of the several states retain the authority to exercise any power that is not delegated to the federal government as long as the Constitution doesn't expressly prohibit it, end quote. Uh, I think this principle can be taken to the, to the local and individual level. So localism's watchword is decentralization. Unlike globalism, this movement is straightforward and honest about its, its objectives. Globalism, on the other hand, acts through deception. After all, it doesn't announce, go around announcing itself that, here we come, we're globalism. Uh, it has to be detected through its effects. For reasons that I'll discuss shortly, localism is the only means, I believe, of circumventing this centralized government in the hands of the federal global state. It is the only antidote to, lo to global tyranny. <clears throat> now, admittedly, of these two orientations, centralized globalism is obviously more powerful, emanating as it does from the government and extra-governmental ruling class. Speaking of the ruling class, Contrary to conscious and unconscious Marxists, the ruling class is the state and its beneficiaries, not the capitalist class. The state is the only entity that extorts wealth from the productive class through coercion and without an agreement. The state is the real conductor and beneficiary of any exploitation. And the ambition of the ruling status is to globalize, leaving no escape from their clutches. Somebody once told me, wouldn't one government be better because then we'd be able to take it over one government. Would one government of all the world be better than like a thousand Liechtensteins or something like that? No. Obviously, it gives you nowhere to go and no uh, escape. That's the definition of global totalitarianism. Uh, so, 
Of course, under globalism, the regime does not operate strictly to serve natural, national interests, as I've said. Or to put it another way, the national interests, as defined by the regime, no longer involve the wheel of the nation, if they ever did. Instead, the ruling class is interested in dissolving this nation into a global hegemon. This global power may be run from the United States, but the ruling class is not interested in maintaining the integrity of the nation per se. Instead, it aims at making the nation part of a global order with the citizens of the United States having no particular claim to exclusive citizenship or the rights and privileges that it entails. This accounts for the unfettered immigration that the state encourages with open borders and social welfare. Much like its corporate partners, the regime is, has become globalist. It is a great reset state, and the nation is now an impediment to its monopolization of power. Now, while the regime has so much power of coercion at its disposal, localism's power lies in the capacity of the productive class to resist by refusing to participate, by withdrawing its consent and precluding its own exploitation. Although status globalists have vastly more resources at their disposal, the, their power, that is the localists, nevertheless depends on the, con uh, I'm sorry, their power, that is the globalists, depends on the consent and participation of the exploited. The main resource of localists is an inexhaustible reserve of independence but to succeed, more and more of the exploited, and this is our job, need to develop a new class consciousness. That is, one that understands the state, which includes its governmentalities, as their real exploiter and oppressor. Uh, likewise, uh, of course, academia has been commandeered as a bulwark against this possibility. Likewise, as Rothbard argued, a cadre of libertarian intellectuals must counter the academic intellectual class and, quote, libertarian education of the public must include an expose of this exploitation and of the economic interests and uh, uh, intellectual apologists who benefit from state rule. Uh, this, I believe, is one of the primary functions of the Mises Institute, as I see it. Now, let's talk a little bit about a bottom-up revolution, if we will. Uh, and here I'm largely going to be citing Hans Hermann Hoppe. As Hans Hermann Hoppe argues, under a democratic system, top-down reform of the state is virtually impossible. The holders of power over public goods have no compulsion to abdicate, abdicate their positions as exploiters, especially given the democratic participation of the exploited. And unlike kings, leaders in democratic states wield an, ex an expanding property base that is not they, uh, their own. Likewise, they have a shorter time preference than kings, which means that they use state resources more and more profitably. Before democracy, writes Hoppe, it would have been necessary only to force a king to declare that from now on every citizen would be free to choose his own protector and pledge allegiance to any government that he wanted. Upon the uh, arrival of democracy, the terms have changed. He says that under democratic rule, the abolition of a government monopoly of justice and protection requires that either a majority of the public and of their elected representatives would have to declare the government's protection monopoly, and ac accordingly, all compulsory taxes abolished, or even more restrictive, that literally no one would vote, and the voter turnout would be zero. Only in this case could the democratic protection monopoly be said to be effectively abolished. But this would essentially mean that it was impossible to ever rid ourselves of an economic and moral perversion. Because nowadays it is, given, it is a given that everyone including the mob, participates in politics. And it is inconceivable that the mob should ever, in its majority or even in its entirety, renounce or abstain from exercising its right to vote, which is nothing else than exercising the opportunity to loot the property of others. Very, <laughs> he has a very good view of democracy, right? This leaves um, decentralized revolution as the only option. The premise is that while people cannot control what the status globalist regime puppeteers attempt to impose on them, 
then likely they are unable, they will be unable to convince the majority to abstain from paying taxes or voting. They can nevertheless cut, cut the puppet strings from themselves. This is also the premise of the grand refusal, the nine point plan to stop the great reset as detailed in my book on sale, the great reset and the struggle for liberty. This means establishing and extending freedom zones where the dictates of the global regime can be resisted. Now, that I just want to make a note that unlike globalism, now uh, localism is anti-totalitarian because it's not going to dictate to all the various localities what they do. And instead, it will allow the various regions to act as they will with response to these global state dictates. Whether they accept them or reject them is entirely their prerogative within, of course, moral, uh, certain moral constraints. We don't uh, believe that uh, they, they would uh, or should be advocating things that are expressly uh, opposed to the non-aggression principle. But uh, instead of some sort of overarching totalitarian imposition, it is down to the localities, as opposed to the central government, to put its own, uh, its own policies and practices in play as far down the scale as possible. <clears throat> now, of course, you're already thinking these, the obstacles of the, this is, are, uh, are manifold, there. but I would argue they're not insurmountable. In fact, it has a better chance of success than any attempt to permanently wrest the reins of the federal government from the grips of the totalitarians who control it. It does not rely on a majoritarian system that is likely rigged against them or in the totalitarians' favor. And it does not depend on convincing the majority of their own servitude. Instead, it depends on the self-determination of properly class-conscious individuals and communities and their capacity to withdraw and flourish independently. The only possibility for resisting and refusing the regime is from the ground up. It must begin with dissociation from the federal global state under a spirit of volunteerism. Only after filtering interests into autonomous or semi-autonomous freedom zones that protect property and individual rights can the project of the nation be reinvigorated. Then and only then might we build a republic on a firm foundation. Only from a position of local freedom can the national project be reconfigured. Now, I would argue also that localism is a distinctly American project it is a movement for independence from tyranny, and it draws from the same in spirit that inspired the first American Revolution. Thank you. Um, take, I'll take some questions. Well, I mean, localism can be populist if it wishes. So it's not necessarily a contrast thing. If uh, the, the particular localities or different uh, regions could be very populist in their orientation. Not that it would matter that much because they're not going to be worried about national elections and things like that. For example, if you go to Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, you don't hear a lot of talk about national politics. and They don't care. What they're trying to do is build a... Uh, autonomous place that resists these impositions and that uh, wrest power from the federal government and invest it in, in themselves. Yes. Can you hear me? Um, yeah. One problem with localism that I've run into because I'm trying to be a local activist is that there are a lot of federal handouts, a lot of federal yeah. grants. And can you address some of the ways we can convince local officials not to be tied to these bloody strings of power? Because yeah, it's I a mean, huge you just impediment. have to know that every handout is actually a rope to hang yourself with. That They just have to be made, it has to be made clear. Look, everything you accept from the state like this, the federal government, comes with a price, and that price is your freedom. It's that simple. I mean, you just have to make that clear. Now, some, you know, this is not easy. This is a pioneering thing, right? This is going to be difficult. It's, I'm not giving you any, this is a white pill, but it's not a silver bullet, okay? There's a difference. Uh, so it takes work. It takes, uh, it takes uh, struggle. 
and it will not be easy, uh, but it has to be done. I was um, I was wondering if, uh, as far as political strategy and localism goes, what you think the path forward for the sympathetic parties, uh, the Libertarian Party and the Republican Party at a local level, how should they go about achieving? Well, I was thinking about that this morning. I was thinking something like this: Amish people only with guns. Frankly. Uh, <laughs> I won't say anything else like about the widening of the gene pool, but you know, Amish people with guns, basically. Directly to that point, the Amish people with guns, do you feel at all like you're abandoning uh, society, abandoning urban life, sort of, you're seeding that ground, right? Like, you know, you believe in libertarianism, we all believe in libertarianism. Um, do we win by shrinking and shrinking and sort of just running away from everyone and letting them just, just control everything except we're in our little corner? Well, that's a great question. I mean, it's a fair question. It's an obvious thing that we should think about. Is doing this running away? Uh, I, I would say I would, I would quibble with the characterization. Um, I don't think it's running away. It's a struggle to build an independent structure that's uh, parallel to, and that will have an impact on the state if it's successful. That will, that will weaken the foundation of the federal glob, global glob uh, that it is. You know, so I, I, if this became something that would catch on, that more and more people would do, then uh, all of a sudden you start to see the impl implosion of the federal government. And that's what we need to see. We're not going to blow it up. It's not going to happen. It's not going to work. We have to, it has to implode. Pardon? Yes, market forces by withdrawing consent and, ex uh, and our, uh, preempting our own exploitation by taxes. Yes. Uh, as I Okay, on the one hand, you're like appealing to the hacker in me. On the other hand, I have to be measured here, and I don't want to... Uh, I, I would say, though, no. I don't believe in sort of like what we might call cyber terrorism or something like that, uh, only because it'll backfire and the repression will only increase. Even Lenin said that, by the way. Uh, he didn't believe in the anarchist approach to uh, taking down capitalism because it would... Uh, you couldn't win by gunpowder. If it were a matter of gunpowder, then, you know, it would already be over by virtue of who owns the most, but it's not that. It's about, it's about people power. So I don't think that we want to do, like, that kind of thing. Now, of course, the non-aggression principle says when I am t attacked and when, I am, uh, when I'm, I'm violated, then I have a right of retaliation. Hey, yeah. Dr. Reckenwald. Um, have you heard of the Free Cities Foundation? Yes. There's the cities called Prospera and Honduras. Um, do you think that's a pretty good strategy? Do you think there are flaws in doing that sort of thing? Or what do you think of that? We have to be very careful with some of these projects because actually some of them are being found, funded by the World Economic Forum. So I would have to look into just what's behind it. There's all these projects and, and they're saying, you know, we'll be in sustainable and they don't say 15-minute cities, but the 15-minute cities is a project from the Globalist World Economic Forum that we don't want any part of because that's in the imposition of these so-called uh, sustainability criteria on the population. So uh, I don't know. I'd have to look into that specific ones uh, to make sure. I, I don't want to make and speak out of school. Uh, thanks for your talk, Dr. Rechtenwald. I, I, I was wondering about another vector of attack other than localism or uh, cyber terrorism, <laughs> um, which is the tort system. Um, you know, you were oh. talking about corporate wokeness, and something that you didn't touch on is the extent to which corporate wokeness is an artifact of the civil rights law, and particularly yeah. things like punitive damages for equal employment uh, opportunity 
yeah. suits. So that seems to be changing. Like there's maybe another little white pill in recent developments at the Supreme Court and at, at lower levels. Yeah. Um, so what do you think about the idea of, you know, shareholder suits uh, for ESG stuff and then, yeah. you know, anti-white racism suits, maybe the kind of stuff Stephen Miller's doing, that kind of a stuff? Absolutely. Yeah, this, is not like, this is not like an either-or thing where this is to the exclusion of everything else. I, I even outline in my book, uh, too, you know, that, for example, ESG is a monopoly scheme, right? So it needs to be fought uh, directly in that sense. And so using the courts to fight, uh, sort of, to sue now, not to, not to have the, the DOJ suing, right? But for individuals and companies to sue uh, various companies and organizations and the state itself for its, pra for its policies and practices, indeed. So this is not to the exclusion of everything. And I, I don't say abandon the, 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 you know, abandon the project of fighting against centralization and uh, all of its various manifestations, but doing it from this foundation uh, of this local movement, localism movement. Uh, here's the last question. Okay. I, I also think localism is probably the best way forward as well. Uh, my fear is that if there isn't enough momentum, uh, they will isolate, uh, you know, come up with some sort of uh, they'll kill us. Yeah, reason. They'll, they'll pull a Waco. <laughs> yeah. They'll pull a Waco, right? Uh, yeah. How do we fight against that? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, we have to be strategic and, how, strategic and tactical in how we form the communities. They have to be large enough and conspicuous enough to not be like a, a house like in uh, Idaho where they can go and kill the, the mother while she's holding a baby and nobody, I mean, people know about it and it's horrible. Uh, or, or like Waco, and, and we, got, we can't do it such that we're isolated to that point. So it has to be tactically and strategically thought out and done from a very, uh, we need to make sure we're building enough of a community before declaring ourselves, you know, a, what we are. Does that make sense? Is it adequate? <laughs> I, uh, yeah, so thank you very much. <laughs>